again, it's good to be back. I get a lot of questions about strength and materials. It's been a while since I've done a strength and materials problem. So here's one that I think is kind of neat. Let's take a look at a beam that's got a distributed load in a, centered on the center line of the beam. And it's got boundary conditions a little bit different than what we might normally see. It, it's pinned at both ends. But on the right end, there's a link here that's at 45 degrees. This would be like if somebody took a rope or a cable or something to hold that end up. And this 45 degrees uh, makes it a little handy. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And what I want us to do is I want us to find out what sigma max is. Now, if it was just bending, we could do it with the load shear moment diagram. But because of the 45 degree link there, there's going to be an axial force on the beam as well that we're going to have to account for. So if you've noticed how we do a lot of these problems, whenever we get a complicated problem that we don't know how to solve completely, what we'll often do is break it down into multiple smaller problems, solve those smaller problems, and then add the results together. And that's what we're going to do right here. So let's get started. Now whenever you start a solution here in, in uh, strength and materials and maybe some other fields, you should always draw a free body diagram very first thing. If you're not drawing a free body diagram, you should ask yourself, Self, why am I not drawing a free body diagram? There are very few good reasons for not doing that. All right, so let's start with that. We've got our beam right here. All right, and we've got a thousand newtons per meter distributed load in the center for a meter, so that's going to give us a thousand newtons across the that center portion of the beam. And I've got, I'm going to need to know what the force is in that uh, link there. So I'm going to need to know force in the y direction and force in the x direction. Now again, let's, let's make sure I'm doing this completely. There's the, there's the positive sign convention, and I'll use this most of the time, so unless I have a good reason not to. Now this is in tension, so it's going to have a component to the right and a component up. This is going to have a component up at the, uh, for the reaction force here, and I'll call that R Y. <coughs> Excuse me. And so if that's pointed to the right, there better be a matching one going off to the left, or this beam's going to be moving. The assumption here is the beam's not moving, it's static. So all the forces have to be in equilibrium. So we'll have the reaction force, the x direction, go to the left. Now last thing here is let's draw the distributed load here. Now I'm going to draw this going down because it's a downward load. Because it's a downward load, if I put this, uh, show this under the beam, I tend to mess up less often. So let's take, take this in uh, two steps here. Let's take a look at the, the bending stresses, the stresses due to that load in the middle of the vertical forces. And then the other thing we'll superimpose over it is the axial forces, the, the uh, stress going in the horizontal direction. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over cold here. So the way we handle bending is we're going to draw a load shear moment diagram. So let's do that first. All right, so this should be, we've done this a lot before, so we should be getting pretty good at this by now. So I've got a load of how much, by the way? If I've got a, a meter-wide distributed load at 1,000 newtons per meter, well, there must be 1,000 newtons. And the fact that this is symmetric side to side must be there's 500 newtons up on each side. So let's put that there. So there's 500, and there's going to be 500 on the other end. And I'm going to have this distributed load here in the center. So there we go. There's the load part of the diagram. In fact, if I'm going to be uh, correct here, I really need to write load and maybe some units would be good. And that's minus 1,000 per meter. Okay, so now that I've got that, let's do the shear diagram. I'm going to move this down a little bit. That's awfully close. Okay, let's do exactly what the load diagram says we ought to do, because shear is load that's accumulated as we go from left to right on the beam. <coughs> so let's do that. Let's start at 500. Okay, we're going to start right up there with the 500, so put that there. There's no accumulated shear until I get to that point right there. Okay, so up to there, to that point, which is one meter over. That's a meter, that's a meter, and that's a meter. Um, until we get to that point, there's no more accumulated shear. And now I start accumulating negative shear at the rate of minus 1,000 newtons per meter. Well, from here to here is a meter, so I'm going to go from 
plus 500 down 1,000 to negative 500. And then I'm going to go over where I don't accumulate any more shear over there. And finally back up when I hit that, that load right there. Okay, so that's minus 500. And there we have the shear. And I'll write this over here. And that's also in newtons. And finally, let's do the moment. Well, the moment is just accumulation of shear. Now, the altitude here is going to equal the slope down there, and the area here is going to be the height down here, the altitude. So, whenever we start talking about heights and slopes and areas, you know there's calculus all over this. For right now, let's just think about it in terms of slopes and areas. That's a little easier to think about, perhaps. And this is moment. And that's going to be in newton meters. Okay. Think about it in area. That's newtons there, and that's meters over there. So the area here must be in newton meters. So the units work out. <coughs> so let's divide this into our three portions again. Equal well, distances of one meter. Now the height here equals the slope down there. Well, that's a constant height. It must be a constant slope. That's a straight line. So we're going to start right up there. And there's going to be a, a matching one on the other end. And then now I've got a varying, or I've got a constant slope but a varying height. So I need a shape that has a large positive slope decreasing to zero slope going to negative slope. Well, that's going to be a parabola. Okay. If you want to think of this as a, a first order curve, or right there where it's got uh, distance from the axis but no uh, no slope. That's right, zero order curve. First order curve does have slope. Second order curve has changing slope. So constant line parabola. That's how this is going. And the only thing we need to know now, really we're looking for maximum uh, stress. So we're going to be looking for where the maximum bending stress is. That's going to be where the maximum moment is. And it's going to be right there. So we need to figure out what that height is. Well, Let's, let's do it in pieces. I want to find out what the height is there. I mean, the height at, at this point, at this intersection, is going to be the, the area there, and I'll call that A1. Well, that's pretty easy. Height times, or base times height, I guess, is the uh, expression for area of a rectangle. Well, the base is 1 meter, and the height is 500. So that's going to be 500 newton meters. All right, the next thing I need to know is this distance here, this change in height to go from here to here. And that's going to be what I'll call A2. That's the area of that triangle. Well, the area of the triangle is 1 half times the base times the height. Well, the base is now half a meter. That was 1 meter here. That's going to be uh, 1 half a meter right there. Well, I can write that better, can't I? That's horrible. Ah, that's much better. Okay, one meter there, half a meter there, height is 500. So half of 500 is 250, half again, because we have one half base height, makes this 125 newton meters there. So the maximum moment is 500 plus 125, that's 625 newton meters. All right, I'm going to leave that there and I'm going to erase some of this stuff. So clear out some room on my little board. <coughs> <coughs> All right, so sigma in bending is m y over i. Well, I know what the uh, moment is. We just figured out that. Now, I don't have y or i here because I can give you a cross-sectional area yet, or cross-sectional dimensions. This is going to be 70 millimeters, and that's going to be 200 millimeters. All right, so we've got 70 millimeters high, 200 millimeters wide. Now, it doesn't matter what this uh, material is made out of, or the, the beam is made out of. It doesn't matter what material it is. Um, I'm going to assume something this big is probably wood or something like that. So maybe this is a, uh, a walkboard on a uh, uh, scaffolding or something like that. Okay, so we're going to need to know Y and we're going to need to know I. Well, Y is going to be 35 millimeters because the centroid is in the center of this geometric center right there. Okay, so halfway is 35 millimeters. And Y is the distance from the centroid to the outside edge. It doesn't matter whether we go up or down, we're still going to get 35 millimeters. The last thing we need to know here is I, and that's 1 12th time, base times height cubed, 
All right, so we're going to get meters to the fourth, and I'm going to do this in meters, not millimeters. Am I going to stay in the frame here? I guess I am. Um, so 1 12th times 0 0.20 meters times 0 0.070 meters cubed. Okay, and I've got that big little cheat sheet over here right now. Um, that's going to be 5.717 times 10 to the minus 6 meters to the fourth, okay? Now, really little number, because a meter's really big, okay? So when you work, when you do these calculations in meters, you tend to get really little numbers. When you do them in millimeters, you tend to get really big numbers. So this is, this is just fine. Um, stress due to bending is now my over i, so it's 625 newton meters times 0 0.035 meters all over 5.717 times 10 to the minus 6 meters to the fourth. Okay, Grind all that out and you're going to get, make sure I do this right, 3.827 megapascals. Okay, Which isn't a whole lot. All right? So this, this is, unless this is a profoundly weak material, we're in pretty good shape right here. So there we have the, the stress due to bending. Now is it positive or negative? Well, it depends. The way we had this set up, this beam is going to, it's eventually going to bend that way. The curvature is positive. This side is going to be in compression. And this side is going to be in tension. Oops, tension starts with a T last I checked. Okay, so that's going to be negative stress and that's going to be positive stress. Now remember, we've got this other stress superimposed over it. And that's the uh, axial stress due to the horizontal load in the beam that came from that 45 degree link. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so we've got 500 newtons going that way and 500 newtons going this way. And we need to know the cross-sectional area. Stress axial equals force over the area and that's 500 newtons times 0 0.2 meters times 0 0.07 meters. Okay, that base times height is the area. And if we work that out, we get this little bitty number, all right? It's 30, 35.7, basically, uh, kilopascals. 357, what did I get, 14? Okay, that's pretty small, okay? But it is going to change this answer a little bit. Now, I can do this two ways. I can superimpose this tensile load, because remember, this is tensile over a compressive load which is negative and it's going to lower the magnitude of the compressive load or I can superimpose it down here over tension and it's going to increase the magnitude. Well I'm looking for maximum stress so I want to superimpose that positive number over this positive number. So after all this the maximum stress is going to be the bending stress in the middle of the beam where the moments were the highest plus the axial stress guess I'll write axial on there all right, plus the axial stress, which is this little number, little but not zero, so let's account for it. And so we get 3.827 megapascals plus 35.714 kilopascals, you know, uh, basically a factor of about 100 smaller. And we add those two up and we get 3.86, I guess I'll do this to uh, four decimal places, or four significant figures there. 3.862 megapascals. So there we go. We started out with a beam that has this unusual boundary condition that it gives us bending stress and axial stress. We solve the, for the two components of stress, the two types of stress individually, and added them together. I hope this helps, and I'll see you next time.